For those who see the world not as it is, but as it can be, who seek to make their vision of the future become reality, their mission is our mission. At Lockheed Martin, we never forget who we're working for. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing today? You all have a, a good, delicious, nutritious lunch, I hope. Um, I don't know about you, I get a little sleepy sometimes right after I eat, so I thought I'd ask you to do just a tiny bit of moving around first uh, before I get started. So let me ask you to please stand up if, if, oh, you're, you're, you're not, all right, you guys are eager. Stand up if you would like to someday go to space. All right, my kind of people. All right, I'm gonna track down a few of you afterwards and ask why not. I'm glad to see most of you standing. Okay, now I'd like you to remain standing if and only if you have already gone to space. All right, I see, oh, okay. I, some people with very good imaginations in the back of the room, but they eventually sat down. It's good, we need people with the good imaginations in addition to the, uh, the, the more grounded people. Uh, what I wanna do, what I've dedicated my life to do, what my friend George, who is supposed to be here today, and, and about 500 of us uh, who work out at this tiny company out in the desert are trying to do, is change that equation a little bit. Make it so that every one of you who stood up for that first session, so first question would remain standing for the second question. Um, I have all my life wanted to go to space. Since I was much, much younger than anyone in this room, I wanted to go to space very, very badly. Uh, and when I was eight years old, I found out I would never get a chance to go to space as a NASA astronaut because I had this little medical condition. It was really bad, you might have heard of it. It's called needing glasses. Right? That's enough, that was enough to knock you out of the NASA astronaut corps. It didn't matter how smart you were, how hardworking you were, how lucky you were, if you had bad eyesight, or any other of a variety of very simple, very survivable medical problems, that was enough to knock you out of this dream. And so when I found out that when I was eight, I said, well, I guess space travel isn't for me, I better move on and find something else to do with my life. Um, that's kind of lame, I think, right? Going to space is cool. I shouldn't have to give up my dream just because I need glasses. This is 2015, right? We're a more evolved society than that. We have glasses, we have contact lenses, we have laser eye surgery. Why aren't those things good enough? Uh, and a lot of other people have felt that way. I think it's incredibly important that we send human beings off this planet to go out and explore the rest of the world. You know, um, when I, th I think of Earth really as our neighborhood. Right? Even though this is a pretty big planet and there's a lot of amazing things for us to see all around the planet. You know, Earth is a really big, diverse place. You can go to other countries, you can go to other continents, you can speak other languages, you can meet other different types of people, and that's fantastic. But we all really do live on this one small planet. And just by beginning to study our neighbor planets, you, you see here on the screen, that's Venus on one side of the screen, that's Mars on the other side. Just our two next door neighbors are really, really, really different from us. In fact, they're a lot more different than you'd expect them to be. Uh, when I went to school, I studied planetary science. And from a planetary scientist perspective, Venus, Earth, and Mars should all be more or less the same. Because on the scale of astronomy, on the scale of planetary science, we're all about the same size, we're all about the same distance from our sun, so you'd expect that the surface conditions on our planets would be about the same. But in fact, they're totally different. Right, Venus, the surface of Venus is hot enough that lead melts. And the surface of Mars is cold enough that carbon dioxide will freeze out of the sky and fall like snow at different parts of the year. That's very, very different from Earth. It was from studying those next door neighbors that we learned a lot more about our home world. We learned that maybe things like greenhouse gases in our, in our atmosphere might make a big difference. Maybe we need to pay attention to things like our water cycles, how water naturally moves in between groundwater and ice and ocean water or lake water, fresh water. Uh, it's just like if any of you have had a chance to leave your own neighborhood and go to another city or go to another country, maybe it didn't just teach you about that new place, maybe it taught you something about where you're from. Because you notice when someone else does something differently than you, maybe they do it better, maybe they do it worse. Maybe you have a new appreciation for what you had at home, or maybe you learn a new skill, some new technique, some new type of food, some new type of music that you can bring back home and you can introduce to your brothers and sisters or to your friends at school, your parents and your teachers. In just the same way, I think we as humans learn a huge amount when we get off the surface of this only planet that humans have ever known, and we go out beyond and we look and we see what's out there, what's in the neighborhood next door. 
But yet, throughout all of human history, we've only just barely begun to do that. Now, this here is a little graphic that I made that shows every single human being who has ever been to outer space, ever, throughout all time. It starts with Yuri Gagarin, the first ever human in space in 1961, and it goes all the way up through the crew that's on the International Space Station going up above our heads right now. To me, I find this number really depressing because it's so small. Because I grew up watching different TV shows than, than y'all have, but uh, you know, I grew up watching The Jetsons and Star Wars and Star Trek. Uh, and those shows, a lot more than 500 people go to space, right? If you're in Star Trek and they visit a new world and that new world has only sent 500 of its creatures into space, generally the story doesn't end very well for those creatures because something bad is coming their way and they don't have anything to do about it, right? I wanted, by the time we reached 2015, which still sounds like the future to me, I wanted this number to be 500 million. And I sure as heck wanted myself to be one of those people, right? I wanted all my friends to be one of those people. I wanted us all to have a chance to go, not just once, but hopefully to go multiple times, and to go for different reasons, to go for fun, to go to do research, to go to make yourself a better teacher, to go to make yourself a better politician. There's lots of different reasons to go. And I look at this 547 and I realize not only is it not a very big number, uh, the 547 people who have gone, who are awesome, they're like genuine heroes of science and math and, and engineering, um, but it's not a very diverse group, right? It's about 90% men, it's about 75% come from only two countries on this planet. There are a lot of people who have never had the experience of meeting an astronaut who looks like them who can speak their language, who comes from their same culture, who practices their same religion, or who practices their own profession. You know, I think about all these astronauts who are asked to do things like go out into schools and talk to people like yourselves, get you inspired about our nation's space program and inspired more generally about science, technology, engineering, and math. And I recognize that, with only one exception, none of them were selected for their job of being an astronaut because they're a good teacher or a good speaker. They're selected because they're a good test pilot or a good doctor, and maybe they are good speakers, a lot of them are because they're really smart and they're good at almost everything, but how cool it would be when the first person goes to space as a teacher because they're a teacher, because that's what they're good at. How much more effective it will be when they come to your school and they know all the tips of the trade about how to communicate with you effectively. How cool it would be when the first movie maker goes, or the first actor or the first ballerina or the first rapper or the first whatever else, the people who know how to communicate to you and your peers in the ways that you like to be communicated to when they have a chance to go. Uh, so what, what we're all about is trying to change that. And, and this is the way we're doing it. My company is building and is now testing a vehicle called Spaceship Two. It's the first ever privately built human spaceflight vehicle. It's the way that if you want to go to space and you don't have perfect vision or you don't have a passport from the right country or you don't have a PhD in astrophysics and you're not a test fighter pilot from the military, it's the way that you can just buy a ticket and go to space. The same way you can buy a ticket and ride the train up to New York City and explore around there or something along those lines. This is not computer graphics. These are real pictures. This is a real vehicle that we are building and we're flying now. Uh, right now we're in our test flight program uh, out in Southern California where I live. This photograph is when we brought our vehicle to our eventual commercial spaceport in the southern part of the state of New Mexico. Now most of you have probably been to an airport or maybe you've been to a port to get on a boat or even a bus terminal. This is a lot like that except instead of a bus or a boat or a plane, you're flying a spaceship into space. When each of you flies to space, and I hope each of you will fly to space, you're going to start your mission by coming to join us here in New Mexico. You're going to spend three days training and preparing for your mission. We've designed it so that basically anyone can fly. We're almost to the point where if you can ride on a roller coaster, you can fly to space. If you have glasses, no problem. I have glasses. I plan on flying on it. Even if you have more serious heart problems, if you, or health problems, if you've had heart issues, if you have an artificial joint, if you have a lot of other things that would have meant space was an impossible dream for you, you get a chance to fly on a vehicle like this. And when I say fly, I mean really fly. Uh, you're gonna go up to uh, about three and a half times the speed of sound, which is really darn fast. It's a lot faster than I've ever been in my life. Uh, you're gonna get pinned into your seat by G-forces during that rocket acceleration part of your flight. Uh, and then at the top, after, after the engine has been cut off, after you're coasting, when you're in space, you're going to have a chance to unbuckle your seatbelt and float around the cabin and experience true weightlessness. And you'll be able to fly through the cabin like Superman or crawl along the walls like Spider-Man if that's what you want to do. 
If you like to do yoga, you'll be able to get into some crazy yoga pose I couldn't ever do uh, here on earth and, and practice in that pose. And perhaps most importantly, you're going to be able to press your face up against the window and you're going to be able to look back on our home world from above and see this picture that only 547 people have ever seen with their naked eyes. Now, if you talk to those 547 people, they'll tell you that seeing this actually has an amazingly profound effect on them because it takes all these things that we know intellectually and it makes them real. When you look down from space at our home world, you notice that the borders that we draw between our states and our countries are almost all imaginary lines. And that maybe makes you think a little bit about the conflicts that we have, the wars that we fight over these tiny little imaginary lines on places that are so close that you can cover them all up with just your thumb in front of the window. You start to notice that thin blue layer of the atmosphere and maybe that teaches you something about what our businesses and our politicians and our people need to do to protect our home planet, to keep the things that keep us safe, safe in turn. It really does change people very, very profoundly and you'll get to see that yourself and hopefully go back and tell all your friends about it afterwards. Uh, now, we are getting ready to start flying people. We're in our test flight program now, so you can't yet fly, but you're going to be able to fly very, very soon. And one thing I'm really proud about is that we've already sold tickets to over 700 people from all around the world. Now, in terms of an airplane or a boat, 700 customers doesn't sound like very many, but when I told you that only 547 people have ever been to space, we're really happy with 700 tickets sold. I also like that these customers come from about 60 different countries which means there's 35 or so different nations on the planet. They're gonna celebrate for the first time ever someone from their nation going into space. There's another 18 or so countries that have sent a boy, that have sent a male into space and they've never yet celebrated a female astronaut. And we have a female who's ready to fly. I get so excited thinking about, you know, having been the student sitting in your seat and hearing astronauts talk to me and inspire me as a child, I get so excited thinking about, you know, the first female from the country of Colombia going into space and going back into the middle schools in her country and talking to her countrywomen and her countrymen about what experience she had, what, it can, what can happen to you if you invest as a nation and as an individual into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, I should point out most of our customers are going for fun, but some of them are also going to do work. Uh, we can fly our vehicle as a tourism vehicle, but we can also fly it as a research vessel, which means that if you have an experiment that you've built, and you want to fly that experiment into space, and maybe you want to fly with the experiment because the science needs it or just because it would be really awesome to fly into it, fly into space with it, uh, you can do that. You can build an experiment now for not that much money, and you can fly it into space within a couple of months. And that's something that people of my generation never had the opportunity to do. You know, I maybe, if I had dedicated my whole life, could have gotten one experiment into space by now. Maybe. We're getting to the point where I think before the time some of you finish high school, your high school class could hold a bake sale and fly an experiment into space before you leave high school. How much better is that going to make your college application look? How much better is that going to make your science fair project? How much better is that going to make your first robotics team or whatever else it is that you believe in? This is a really exciting thing and there's no age limit required on this. You can start doing this as a young kid. You can, with your parents' help, your teacher's help, set up a Kickstarter campaign and get some local mentors. There are tons of people who will be thrilled to help you out with this because we desperately, as an industry, we desperately need young people like you to get involved because you're going to be the ones who are leading us into the future. You know, along those same lines of flying experiments to space suborbitally on these very inexpensive but also very brief flights to space on Spaceship Two, uh, what we're working on here is, uh, is uh, let me, I'll come back to that. What we're working on also is, is the idea of flying a lot more satellites into space. Now, there have been many more than 547 satellites into space. We, we fly many of them every year, but still not that many. Here's one thing that's really interesting to me. This is a picture of the first ever American satellite to fly into space. It was called Explorer 1, and I like it. You can see very clearly the size of that satellite. It's, you know, yay big. And in fact, a lot of that is the final part of the rocket that got it to space. So really, the satellite itself is about this big. It weighed about 50 or 100 pounds. It was pretty small. Here's the interesting thing. This is in the late 1950s. Uh, satellites today are much, much, much bigger than this stage that I'm standing on. They're about the size of the school bus that many of you ride to school every morning. Right? And they don't weigh 50 pounds or 100 pounds. They weigh 10,000 pounds. How weird is that? Because think of any other type of electronics or computers in 1960 versus today. Right? They went from computers the size of this room to there's probably like 10 computers just in this thing I'm holding in my hand. 
Right? They've all gotten smaller, they've all gotten lighter, they've all gotten cheaper, which means that now each of us owns 10 computers. Right? Because satellites have gotten bigger and more expensive, each of us doesn't own our own satellite yet. There are still not that many countries that can afford to fly satellites, much less companies or much less individuals, because they're big, because they're expensive. That has started to change in recent years. It started in universities, and now it's gone out into NASA, it's gone out into other government agencies, it's gone out into private companies, and now it's starting to go out to things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. This is a satellite. This is something called a CubeSat. It's literally a cube 10 centimeters to an edge. It's about the size of a coffee mug. That thing can fly in space and it can work. And it can do more than that satellite did in 1960. It can do more than satellites were doing 10 or 15 years ago. It turns out that if you just take the smartphone that I bet a lot of you in this room have in your pocket, if you think about it, this has a better camera on it than almost anything that's ever been in space. It has a much faster computer processor than anything that's ever been in space before. It has three axis accelerometers, so it knows where it is, what position it is, it knows when I'm moving it around. It is conditioned so that if I forget it and I leave it in my car in the Mojave Desert in Southern California when it's 110 degrees outside and this thing bakes like an oven, it still works. And if I do the same thing in Winnipeg, Canada and it gets down to minus 40 or minus 50, it still works. If I drop it, I won't do it right now because it would probably break just to prove me wrong, but generally speaking, you've probably dropped your phone, it probably still works. Uh, why do satellites need to be so big? Why do they need to be so expensive? This satellite you see a picture of was actually called a phone sat because someone at a NASA lab bought a phone. It was a, one of the early Android phones and just took the parts out of it and put it in this slightly different shape so you could get solar panels and flew it into space and it worked. And it cost a couple thousand dollars. You know, a big NASA or a big military satellite can cost a couple billion dollars. Um, some of you maybe, if you, if you worked really hard with the support of your friends and your family, you could raise a thousand dollars. I don't think any of you could raise a billion dollars. Right? I want to get it so that each of you can fly your own satellite. Because that's going to make you smarter, it's going to make you better students, it's going to make you better applications, and it's going to make you better employees when I want to hire you to come and work for my company. And trust me, I really want to hire you to come and work for my company. That's why I'm here. Right? It's all about getting you kids better and making sure you don't just start in the science pipeline, but you stay in it so that when you're ready to fly and, or ready to work in a couple years, you want to come and work for me. Uh, so my company, we're trying to help out with this problem. We noticed, yes, finally, finally, after decades, satellites are getting faster and smaller and cheaper, but it doesn't do you much good to build a satellite for $1,000 if getting it to space still costs you $100 million, right? Now you just have a nice $1,000 paperweight on your desk. It'd be a lot nicer if the ride to space was cheap. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're using some of the same technologies that we're using to fly human beings into space much more affordably than ever before to now fly satellites into space. Uh, we're, we are a team that I feel incredibly proud to work alongside. There's about 500 of us now. Almost all of us have degrees in science, technology, engineering, or math, but not all of us. Uh, I have coworkers. I have a coworker who's a fashion designer, an industrial designer. I have coworkers who are lawyers. I have coworkers who are accountants. I have coworkers who work in our human resources department, helping us hire great young people like yourself. Uh, we need all kinds of people. When you apply to work at a company like mine or any of the others that you're hearing from today, when you have a chance to go and talk to the speakers, I bet you're going to hear a lot of the same themes from them. When you ask them, hey, what's it going to take for me to get a job when I apply to you? What do I do if I want to be as successful as Dean Kamen or Megan Smith or any of the other wonderful people you've heard up here on stage? They're going to probably tell you a couple of the same things. One, you have to be passionate. You have to love this stuff. And frankly, if you can't love the idea of sending astronauts into space, what can you love? Right? I love sports as much as anyone else, but astronauts are just cooler. Astronauts are awesome. Satellites are awesome. And being an astronaut is way cooler than just looking at someone else who's an astronaut. Building a satellite is way cooler than just looking at the data that comes down from someone else's satellite. When you apply for a job or when you apply for school, when you're trying to get that scholarship that allow you to go to the dream school of your choice and be very, very successful there, one of the things they're most going to want to see is what have you done? Not just what have you studied, what have you memorized? What can you repeat back to me that some teacher or parent taught you? They want to see, what did you do? What did you build? What did you dream up, and how did you make it happen? And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It doesn't really matter that much if it worked. If you built a really ambitious robot, or particularly for my company, if you built a really ambitious satellite, and it broke, and it didn't get back the data, 
Don't be embarrassed about that. Be proud about that. Because I know the first time anyone tries something, it always breaks. It never, ever works. And frankly, I would rather that you made that mistake on your own time than on my time. Because once you've had that terrible experience of this thing that you've poured your soul into, going up to space, you finally got in the ride and it didn't work right, I can guarantee you're never gonna make that same mistake again. I can guarantee you learned something that you never would have learned, no matter if you got an A plus on every single one of your tests. I, I work alongside 500 people that have done exactly that, and I hope in the not too distant future I'll be working on alongside 500 more that are doing the exact same thing. So thanks very much for coming today. I think we've left time for questions, and I hope you'll try and stump me with some good ones. All right, Mr. Pomerantz.